Hello viewers, I am Dr. Robul. I work as a lecturer of pathology in a medical college hospital and I am making this video for my students and also for you. Hope someone finds this helpful. Today's topic is asthma. In this video, first we will try to define asthma, then we will discuss briefly about its common clinical features, diagnosis, classification. We will also discuss briefly about atopy and allergy, followed by a discussion on atopic asthma, how atopic asthma develops, what are the triggering factors of asthma, followed by treatment and prognosis of asthma. Okay, so let's begin. First question, what is asthma? The word asthma derived from a Greek word that means panting, that is breathing with short, quick breath. But how can we define asthma? So now I will tell you a long definition of asthma, but don't get scared because I will explain this definition line by line afterwards. So, asthma can be defined as a chronic inflammatory disorder of the airway that is associated with airway hyperresponsiveness, recurrent episode of wheezing, breathlessness, chest tightness, cough, particularly at night or in the early morning. The episodes are variable in nature but widespread obstruction occurs and they are reversible either spontaneously or with treatment. Okay, so I hope you're still with me. You didn't run away just like my students do when I try to teach them long definitions of pathology. I even have to show them teddy bear to keep them calm. So look, I am even showing you a teddy. So keep calm, don't run away because now I will explain this long definition. So what did I say in the first line of the definition? Asthma is a chronic inflammatory disorder of the airway. And always remember when I am saying chronic disorder, in fact, asthma is one of the most common chronic disorders. It is estimated that about 300 million people worldwide are affected by this disease. And the prevalence of asthma is increasing and it's increasing more particularly in children okay so always remember that asthma is a chronic inflammatory disorder of the airways what did I say in the second part of the definition characterized by recurrent or repeated episode of wheezing chest tightness breathlessness and cough now what do we mean by wheezing so always remember wheezing is a high pitched whistling sound that is heard during expiration in a patient of asthma. But one thing you have to remember that wheezing can be heard in some other pulmonary disease as well. And when you are not hearing wheezing that doesn't exclude the possibility of asthma. Okay. So always keep this information in your mind. So now that we have defined asthma and explained the definition, now we will move on to the next topic and that was the clinical features of asthma. Now you have already noted that I have almost told you the entire clinical feature of asthma in the definition and you are right. So, the clinical features of asthma will include, of course, wheezing, chest tightness, breathlessness, cough, particularly at night or in the early morning. And cough may be one of the most common symptoms in case of uh, children. And one important thing you have to know, in certain people and in children who has less ability to locate the area of discomfort they may even complain of tummy ache okay and uh, these are the common clinical features of asthma the asthma symptoms can occur in a variety of pattern they include episodic 
frequent episodic and persistent type. In the episodic type, the attack of the asthma will be occasional, well defined and it will last for hours to days and there will be no symptom in between the attacks. Okay, so that is the episodic uh, pattern of asthma symptom. In the frequent episodic type, the frequency of asthma attack will be more frequent and the exacerbation will last longer, usually for days to weeks. And in the persistent um, variety of asthma symptom, unfortunately, um, the patient will have uh, symptoms continuously, that is, there will be some symptoms even when the patient is apparently well. So, now that we have discussed about the clinical features and uh, symptom patterns of asthma, now we will move on to the next topic and that is the diagnosis of asthma. The diagnosis of asthma can be made on the basis of patient's symptoms, medical history, and some lung function tests are also useful to assess the severity and variability of the airflow limitation and also to confirm the diagnosis of asthma. So I have already mentioned the common clinical features of asthma. So if a patient uh, comes to the physician with uh, these common clinical features, then there is increased suspicion that this patient may have asthma. Regarding the medical history, if the patient, in addition to these clinical features, also gives history of atopy or allergy, say for example, the patient also gives history of hay fever, eczema, or family history of allergy, or if the patient mentions some triggering factor, um, certain things that triggers his attack, say for example, like exercise, cold weather, certain drugs, dust, pollen, emotional stress, animal fur, certain chemicals, etc. So if the patient also mentions these triggering factors, then there is high probability that the patient may have asthma. We will also uh, do some lung function test to confirm the diagnosis. So the commonly used lung function test to assess and confirm asthma include spirometry and peak expiratory flow measurement. So we will talk about these two tests and also discuss reversibility tests uh, in these cases. So what do we uh, do with spirometry? Spirometry is the preferred method that is used to detect the airway limitation and also to detect the reversibility of this limitation. And always remember that um, with spirometry we can measure FEV1. What is FEV1? FEV1 means force expiratory volume in one second. That is the volume of air that has been forcefully exhaled in the first second. So, um, if there is more than 12% increase in FEV1 or more than 200 milliliter increase in FEV1 after administration of some bronchodilator, then that will indicate that um, the patient has a reversible airflow limitation so that is reversibility test positive by spirometry and these findings will be consistent with asthma but one thing you have to remember even asthma patients will not always um, show reversibility test positive so repeated uh, test is advised to confirm the diagnosis okay so that is spirometry and reversibility test uh, by using spirometry the second um, common lung function test is measurement of peak expiratory flow with the help of peak flow meter and normally uh, we compare the patient's best peak expiratory flow um, his previous best 
peak expiratory flow uh, with the findings that we will get after administering bronchodilator. So if his or her peak expiratory flow increases more than 20% or increases more than 60 liter per minute after administration of bronchodilator compared to his previous best peak expiratory flow finding prior administration of the bronchodilator then we will say that in that case reversibility test is positive and also there is another thing that you will see in your textbook regarding peak expiratory flow measurement if there is more than 20 percent diurnal variation in peak expiratory flow then that is also suggestive of asthma okay so these are the two most common lung function tests that we will use to assess and confirm asthma the spirometry and peak expiratory flow but sometimes uh, a patient may come with the clinical features of asthma but these lung function tests may be normal what will we do then in those cases additional tests are available they include challenge test say for example methapoline challenge test histamine challenge test exercise challenge test etc to confirm the diagnosis so one additional thing that i have to mention regarding the um, diagnosis of asthma um, sometimes it is very difficult to diagnose asthma especially um, in children less than five years and also in elderly um, patient where it is very difficult to diagnose and differentiate asthma from COPD. Asthma is also very difficult to diagnose in some other cases say for example the cough variant asthma, exercise induced asthma and occupational asthma. These uh, varieties of asthma are very difficult to diagnose and uh, very thorough history must be taken and some other additional tests must be performed to confirm diagnosis of asthma in these cases. So the examiner may ask you uh, what are the condition where it is very difficult to um, diagnose asthma. Then your answer will be asthma less than five years old, asthma in children less than five years old, asthma in the elderly and also cough variant asthma, exercise induced asthma and even some occupational asthma. These types of asthmas are difficult to diagnose. So now that we have discussed about the diagnosis and reversibility tests of asthma, now we will move on to the next topic and discuss the classification of asthma. So asthma can be classified in a variety of way. We can classify asthma on the basis of onset, severity, control, on the basis of presence or absence of atopy, on the basis of underlying cause, etc. So, on the basis of onset, asthma can be childhood onset asthma, adult onset asthma, and asthma in the elderly. On the basis of severity, asthma can be intermittent, mild persistent, moderate persistent, and severe persistent in nature. On the basis of presence or absence of ATP, asthma can be atopic asthma, which is also known as extrinsic asthma or non-atopic asthma which is also known as intrinsic asthma and then again on the basis of underlying cause we can classify asthma in a variety of way say for example exercise induced asthma drug induced asthma occupational asthma and so on and also on the basis of control we can also classify asthma as controlled poorly controlled, partially controlled, etc. Okay, so there is a lot of classification of asthma. So now that we have uh, briefly um, discussed the overview of those classifications, now we will move on to the next topic and that is a discussion on atopy and allergy. Now atopic asthma is a very high yield topic for your examination and in order to understand atopic asthma, 
First, we need to know what is atopy and what is allergy. So atopy is predisposition of an individual to produce immunoglobulin E in response to an allergen. Atopic individuals usually have a family history of eczema or hay fever or asthma and they often show positive skin test in response to common allergen. So one thing we have to remember in most of the cases atopic individuals uh, will have a tendency to produce abnormally high amount of immunoglobulin E and that will result in these allergies. So that is in short about HOP. Now what do we mean by allergy? The clinical presentation of HOP is known as allergy. Okay? So clinical presentation of HOP when an atopic individual is showing um, clinical features or clinical presentation that is known as allergy. So now that we have cleared what is atopy and what is allergy, now we will move on to the next topic and discuss the pathogenesis of atopic asthma. This is a very high yield topic for your examinations. You will often have a question about the pathogenesis of atopic asthma. Now one thing you have to remember, there are two major etiological factors responsible for development of atopic asthma. The first one is HOP. That means there must be a genetic predisposition of the individual to produce excess amount of immunoglobulin E or type 1 hypersensitivity. And the second etiological factor is exposure of that atopic individual to some triggering agent. And although we will talk about triggering factors after a while, but in many cases, the triggering factors may be poorly defined. So what will happen to an atopic individual when that individual is exposed to certain allergen? So let's see what happens by looking at this image. So suppose this is the lining epithelium of that atopic individual's respiratory tract. The individual has just inhaled an allergen for the first time in his life. Okay, now that allergen may be pollen, it may be dust, certain chemicals, etc. Then what will happen? That allergen will move through his respiratory tract and in the respiratory tract, there are a lot of antigen-presenting cells besides the lining epithelium. And what will those antigen-presenting cells do? They will engulf that allergen, then they will process that allergen and present that allergen to T helper 2 cell. Now, one important thing you have to remember, whenever you say the term antigen presenting cells, the examiner may ask you, tell me the names of some common antigen presenting cell. And the answer will be, common antigen presenting cells include macrophages, dendritic cell, and B lymphocyte. Okay, so always keep that in your mind. So, going back to the discussion, an allergen was inhaled for the first time, then antigen presenting cell for example, I have drawn a dendritic cell here. So antigen presenting cell will engulf that allergen. It will process that allergen and then it will present the antigen to T helper 2 cell. What will happen next? Once T helper 2 cell gets that antigen, that will result in induction of T helper 2 cell. That is when the antigen presenting cell presents the antigen to T helper 2 cell that will result in induction of the T helper 2 cell. And as a result of that induction, T helper 2 cell will release a lot of cytokines. Now in your textbook you will see a lot of cytokines, uh, but the most important ones are the interleukin 4, interleukin 5 and also interleukin 13. So what will they do? 
Interleukin-4 is a cytokine released from the T helper 2 cell and that will work on another lymphocyte that is B lymphocyte and that will result in class switching of the antibodies on the surface of B lymphocyte. Recall from your immunology classes that B lymphocyte is a lymphocyte and on the surface of B lymphocyte there are a lot of antibodies but initially the antibodies are not IgE they are IgM right and later what will happen there will be class switching and they will become immunoglobulin E and those immunoglobulin E antibodies will be released from the B cell okay so I hope you're still with me it's a bit long topic but you need to know this so what would happen when the B cell does its IgE class switching and releases that immunoglobulin E those immunoglobulin E will move on and then they will bind on the surface of mast cell okay so this is an image of mast cell and on the surface of mast cell there are receptor for the FC portion of the immunoglobulin E and the name of this receptor is very important you may be asked in in your exams what is the name of the receptor on the surface of the mast cell that strongly binds with IgE antibody and your answer will be the name of the receptor is FC Epsilon R1 okay so it's a long name but you have to remember this name so I'm going back to the discussion again so the antibody the IgE antibody will bind with the FC Epsilon R1 receptor on the surface of the mast cell and up to this stage is known as sensitization okay so after first exposure the mast cells will be sensitized that means when the IgE molecule binds with the FC epsilon R1 receptor of the mast cell that is known as sensitization okay now what will happen when there is re-exposure or subsequent exposure of that atopic individual with the same allergen. Re-exposure or subsequent exposure will result in a different scenario. Okay, so here you can see this was sensitization. Okay, I didn't mention the role of the other cytokines. So just to know that there are other cytokines involved. One is interleukin-5 and the other one is interleukin-13. The role of interleukin-5 is to help in eosinophil recruitment or inactivation of the recruited eosinophil. And the role of interleukin-13, it has two important roles. One, it helps in IgE class switching. And another role is it helps in mucus secretion from the bronchial subepithelial glands. Okay, so that's nice to know. So coming back to the discussion, what will happen when there is re-exposure of that atopic individual with same allergen? So here is the same allergen. It has been reintroduced into his respiratory system. But look now what's happening. Now this allergen will form cross bridge. It will bridge the IgE molecules that were bound on the surface of the mast cell and whenever there is cross-linking of the IgE molecule on the surface of the mast cell that will result in signal transduction so this is the FC epsilon R1 receptor whenever there is cross-linking of the IgE molecule the cytoplasmic portion of that receptor will give some signal okay and that will result in a lot of things so one signal will be given to the granules recall that in your mast cell we have a lot of granules and inside those granules we have a lot of chemical mediators so one signal will go to those granules and that will result in mast cell degranulation so when there is degranulation of the mast cell that will result in release of histamine protease eosinophil chemotactic factor, neutrophil chemotactic factor, etc. 
The second signal will activate membrane phospholipase A2 and that will result in breakdown of membrane phospholipid into arachidonic acid and later from that we will get prostaglandin D2 and leukotrienes B4, C4, D4 and all these things will have role in asthma. The third signal will work in the nucleus that will result in activation of genes responsible for making some cytokines. So as a result, newer cytokines will be produced. So all these things will result at first in immediate reaction or early phase reaction. And in early phase reaction, we will have bronchospasm, we will also have vasodilation and vascular leakage. The early asthmatic response usually begins within minutes, peaks at about 15 minutes and disappears in about 3 hours. Okay, so that is the early phase reaction of asthma. Now, in case of 50% of adult atopic individual and in case of 70% of the atopic children, we will also see another phase and that is the late phase reaction that will develop several hours afterwards and uh, it will last for 18 to 24 hours. So why will that thing occur? Why will we have a late phase reaction in asthma? And the answer lies here. Now look at the bottom of the image you can see I have drawn leukotriene B4, C4, D4 and there are some other mediators that will result in leukocyte infiltration. Those mediators will attract different white blood cells. Say for example they will attract eosinophil, neutrophil as well as the lymphocytes. And remember I told you about interleukin 5. Interleukin 5 had a role in eosinophil recruitment. And also you can see that I have written eotaxin that is something liberated from this epithelial cell. Eotaxin also plays a role in eosinophil recruitment. Similarly, once eosinophil, neutrophil, lymphocyte, they have been gathered into the site, they themselves also release a lot of mediators. Say for example, eosinophil itself will release major basic protein and that thing will damage epithelial cell and result in further bronchoconstriction. Okay, so that is in short about the late phase reaction. So in late phase reaction we will have leukocyte infiltration, epithelial damage and further bronchospasm. So now that we have discussed briefly about the pathogenesis of atopic asthma. Now we will move on to the next topic and discuss the triggering factors of asthma. So the triggering factors of asthma will vary according to individual, but the common triggering factors include house dust mite, cold weather, exercise, emotion, pollen, animal dander, certain drugs, say for example beta blocker, NSAID, aspirin, etc., certain food, some special occupation, chemicals, even smoking, infection, and aspergillus fumigates. All these can result in asthma. These things can be triggering factors for asthma. But one thing you also have to remember in many cases the triggering factors are poorly defined. We cannot identify triggering factors of asthma in every scenario. Okay, so now that we have discussed briefly about the triggering factors of asthma, now we will move on to the next topic and discuss the treatment options of asthma. So there are four components of asthma care and although we will discuss mainly the drug treatments, it is very important to know the four components of asthma. The first component is development of a partnership between the asthma patient and the healthcare team or the physician. Now why is this important? Because this partnership will enable the patient to understand the risk factors of asthma. The patient will know the difference between 
controller and reliever medication of asthma. It will also help the patient to learn proper inhaler technique because since most of the asthma medications are often taken via the help of inhaler, it is very important to know how to use the inhaler properly. And this partnership will also help the patient to assess his or her asthma on the basis of symptoms or peak flow measurement and it will also help the patient to learn when to seek advice from the physician. So that's the first component of asthma care that is to establish a partnership between the patient and the healthcare team. The second component is to identify and reduce the risk factors. The third component is assessment, treatment and monitoring of asthma and we will discuss about treatment after a while. And the fourth component is management of exacerbation of asthma. So now we will move on to the drug treatment of asthma and in your textbook you will see that there is a long list of drug treatment according to age group asthma under two years asthma under five years asthma in the adult asthma in the elderly so there are a lot of uh, variation in the treatment and if we try to discuss all of them it will take another hour so I will mainly focus on the management of asthma in adult but do remember that uh, management of asthma in other age groups will need some tweaking or variation okay so as you can see I have drawn some um, flowchart here and one thing you have to remember we will use two type of medication in management of asthma. The first one is reliever. They include beta 2 agonist. They will cause bronchodilation by the sympathetic nervous system stimulation and they will also include anticholinergic or antimascarinic drug which will cause bronchodilation by blocking the vagal or mascarinic or parasympathetic um, nervous system okay so they will act by blocking the parasympathetic or vagal um, nerve so these are the reliever like I said beta 2 agonist and anticholinergic drug and the second group is preventer and uh, in this group we will use inhaled and oral corticosteroid there will be some other drugs like there will be leukotriene receptor antagonist theophylline chromones etc so now let's see how can we manage asthma in adult and in your textbook you will see that we can manage this thing by a step care method so we will increase step according to symptoms so if the patient has mild intermittent symptom we will just give him treatment according to step one and that is just giving him or her inhaled beta 2 agonist as needed if that doesn't control the patient's asthma we will move on to step two and there we will add inhaled corticosteroid the range is 200 to 800 microgram per day and we will usually give 400 microgram per day okay so that is step two regular preventer therapy we are adding this drug in addition to the inhaled beta 2 agonist that we will use as required if the patient's asthma is still uncontrolled then we will move on to step three and in step three which is also known as the add-on therapy here we will add LABA now what do you mean by LABA? long acting beta 2 agonist now what will we do afterwards? if the patient's condition improves we will continue with this LABA this additional drug besides using the previous drug and um, if that doesn't uh, help the patient, then we will stop lava and increase the inhaled corticosteroid 
dose up to 800 microgram per day. Additional drugs can be given, which we will see after a while. So that's the step three. On step four, if the patient's asthma is still uncontrolled, then we will move on to the next step. And here we will increase the inhaled corticosteroid dose up to 2000 microgram per day. And if still the control is poor, we will add additional drug which will include leukotriene receptor antagonist and slow release oral theophylline. If the patient's asthma is still uncontrolled, then we will move on to the last step, and that is the step 5. We will maintain high dose of inhaled corticosteroid, 2000 microgram per day, and at the same time we will add oral steroid tablet daily. And if the patient's condition is still not controlled, then we have to refer the patient to hospital for admission. So this is in short about the treatment plan by a step care management in adult. So now that we have uh, given an overview of the treatment and discussed the step care management in adult, now we will move on to the next topic and discuss the prognosis of asthma. So the prognosis of asthma is variable. It is seen that in 54% cases there is variable outcome and in 44% cases there is complete remission and in 2% cases the asthma is persistent. So if the parents of a child with asthma asks you whether their child will grow out of asthma, you have to say that it is very difficult to say that at this early stage. However, if proper medication is given and proper preventive measurements are taken, there is good chance that the children's symptoms can be totally eliminated in most of the cases. So this concludes today's discussion on asthma. This was a long topic and for my students, I hope you will go through your textbooks to look at different flowcharts and images for more information and I will also post some additional image slides in my Facebook page to help you with this topic. So that's all for today. For my viewers, if you like my video, do comment and subscribe to my channel and let me know. So that's all for today. See you again hopefully within a week or two with a new topic of pathology. Until then, take care and stay blessed.